As I mentioned, we made this crazy found footage movie together with like three people in a cabin in the woods, and the whole time she was stressed out, thinking, I don't know if I'm gonna go make this movie, I might go make this movie, I hope it could go. I was like, and a new walker was out every yeah, day, someone, yeah. and a new rejection came every night. And so, I, I, I mean, I felt like I was there for at least that part of the roller coaster, and then the next thing we know, you were in upstate New York yeah. uh, at summer camp, yeah. making this film. Exactly, it felt like summer camp. Can you, can you talk about how this project came to you and what drew you to it initially and what, what, what got you back on the book? Yeah, I'm going to play Drake Downs on every photo that every Twitter is going to make me look like a monster. <laughs> uh, so, um, I'm going to do this. Anyway, hi. So, um, I read the book when it first came out in 2012, and I loved it. I really fell in love with it. It was the first really honest depiction I'd seen of being a teen in a book. I mean, it was the only depiction of being a queer teen I'd ever read. But then forget that. It was just, it really captured the, the weird combination of like the drama and the angst that you feel in your head where you're like, everything is the worst, and then everything is the best. I'm discovering sex for the first time, not me as a teen, but other teens. I'm discovering <laughs> sex for the first time. And like, I am speaking the same language as people, and I have a freedom uh, and autonomy against my parents that I've never had before, and like discovering that your parents don't actually have all the answers, uh, mixed with like the banality. <laughs> like, yeah. oh, I'm at everyone else's disposal, and like, I can't make my own choices. And so this is Howard. So all of that, it reminded me of a Todd, uh, a John, John Hughes song. Mm. I've been talking so much today about myself. Yeah. <laughs> So it reminded me of a John Hughes film, and I love John Hughes films, and I felt like TV films in the past few decades haven't been that honest about the experience, and they're very paint by numbers, and they don't speak to the messiness that I felt and the abuse that I knew at that age, which was far more subtle and at the hands of people who loved me and wanted the best for me, and yeah. were just operating from a place of fear. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I mean, obviously, you know, I, I thought a lot about the, the shame while you're watching the movie and, and how shame gets passed down and how totally. it's totally inherited yeah it's inherited and it's this like odd human trait where it's like well you i have this you need this yeah. too and this is something that you know our parents love to pass down through, through uh, <laughs> yeah through. i keep saying like before i can have a kid i want to like exercise myself of this shame so i don't give it to someone else i i, I definitely think it uh, transmitted through the blood yeah <laughs> um and then chloe how, like how did it come yeah. to you um Basically, I got, I got just kind of came across my desk, yeah. and I had just taken about a year off from, from my career to figure out what content I wanted to put forward mm -hmm. and who I wanted to be in this new phase of, of my career. And this one, it hit in a space that I, I hadn't been, I guess, I hadn't felt this way about a character before. She was so dynamic and, and and strong but fragile at the same time, um, and unaffected, but still under this umbrella of conversion therapy. And it just, I don't know, it was a very interesting project, and um, I loved Desi's work, and I think that she had a really interesting in on the movie, and I think connected to the comedic beats in it instead of just focusing on the darkness of conversion therapy was important, and I think that needed to be depicted on screen. Yeah, and, and not and not demonizing people who are doing therapy. Yeah, yeah, and not not showing you know her opinion down your throat. I mean, it's it's really it doesn't tell you to hate either side. You actually end up, I think, in the end, you end up having empathy for the people that they, that are the abusers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I um, I mean, I I loved it every time you decided to just let. A shot linger and, and, and let and let it sort of like the, the story be told just in that moment. Uh, and, and so it's funny because you, you do it like three major times in the movie, and the first two are sex scenes. And it made me think about. I remember you and I talking about how much um, you were bummed out by Blue is the Warmest Color and the sex scenes in the middle of that, where it's like you're kind of watching this intimate movie and. Yeah, and it's you know, so intimate. There's so much subjectivity in the way that the romance is shot and that woman's journey is. Like, I love the non-sex part of right. the movie. And, and then all of a sudden you get like a porno movie in, in, in the middle of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, super clinical, no intimacy, just like, yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> Love slapping. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I thought what was so cool about this movie is like you just you like we're in it where the audience is sort of implicated in it and you're just sort of forced to experience it and it, you know I don't know at least for me it does that thing that I think um, I was I was thinking about that you know like sort of like art dealing dealing with queer identity that I've seen recently and like you know. Like, Moonlight, I feel like, does this. I felt like the, the play version of Fun Home did this for me. Oh my god, so I'm obsessed with that play. Oh my god, yes. it's, so it's so good. But it, it does, it does this thing where it just, it just like, it just like kind of creates inarguable points. It's like this yeah. is someone, um, you know, having their experience. This is someone's testimony, and how can you argue with that? You know, and I, I thought your movie did that as well. It was so nice. And then Julian did the music for the movie. Uh, it was more because it's a period piece. Did you guys talk about it, like having it tie into the music of the of the time? Because it's early nineties, right? It's early nineties. Okay. I mean, you should talk about how we started. I just remember a lot of our time was Boys of Canada. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Radiohead. Yeah, totally. Which is like right up my alley. I kind of grew up on that stuff. I feel like one thing we discussed, one thing you said to me that I really liked. I think I kind of went with this. Was like. The music as a memory of like a grown up Cameron, you know, sort of like a so the music sounding like a, a memory. Yeah, like a memory of the nineties, if not literally nineties. Like a little better than the music of the nineties. <laughs> yeah, something I yeah, I don't know if it's better, but <laughs> it's different. <laughs> but I like that. I thought that was a really fun way to approach it, you know, and that's so it's kind of dreamy, but it's rooted in kind of a nineties sound, and that was really fun to do. Yeah, and it was tricky because I hate score. I think you know this about me. Well, yeah, so I just feel like I made the music sound like it was cool songs that we found. Exactly, you know? exactly. And, I was like, and that was the instrumentation, too. I feel like yeah. you were finding new instruments in your home that yeah. felt more conducive to um, making it a little bit edgy, a little rougher, a little, yeah. a little more found. Like, like I, I, I like the rougher recordings you did. I never yeah. wanted things to feel clean. The, the best was the day that you were kind of sitting there doing other work, and yeah. I was just like jamming for like oh three God. hours. Yes. And then like I would just know when she was like, huh, like she would like react really subtly, I'm like, okay, good, that, like, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. that was like really fun. <laughs> yeah, that's the process. But um, I think that what was tricky about this, and I don't use score very often or ever, and what I, what I learned crafting this movie with my editor and my producers, was um, how to be emotionally manipulative. Like normally I'm like, here's the scene, take it or leave it. But the juxtaposition of a lot of the moments here, and we, we shot more than we used in the film, so we have like an hour of extra footage to reappropriate into memories. And then the juxtaposition, like, like the mark breakdown didn't work until my editor intercut it with Cameron finding the blood, and then put a violin virtuoso track under it, and suddenly you're like, oh god, I'm crying. And that's the level of manipulation, that, like, or craft. The word is craft, but I say manipulation. <laughs> it's a level of craft that I didn't have before, and the score was another piece of that. And when the the reprise, the main theme of the film is to me, I don't know if you qualify it that way, but um, when they're walking in the woods, this song plays. And oh yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. That's, yeah. And you did two reprises of it. Yeah, I think we did that. Yeah, two or three times. It, yeah. it is a theme. I love that. Yeah, and it's a really simple melody, and it's really emotionally evocative, and it, it um, does me in a little, and it was really hard for me to communicate with someone. That was one of the biggest challenges of making this film to me, is communicating with what music gives what emotion, and it's so personal. But when we found that theme, I felt like we needed a benchmark for a few experience. And I will say, sorry to do your job, but I want to say like, I love it. Uh, <laughs> another thing I experienced in the edit was, and this was, we brought on an additional editor at a certain point, uh, Joe Lindauer, who uh, worked in conjunction with my editor, and it was a really great uh, partnership between the three of us. And one thing he said when we entered the editing room is, when I hear you guys talk about Helen, the character that Melanie plays, it's very clear that you love her more than I'm seeing it on the screen. And he did a pass of the Christian rock and all her scenes where you could see on screen how much we loved her. And that's it. I don't know if I told you this, but like, because we, we talked about you constantly. Not you, you, not you, Helen. Because I'm a Helen. 
Like everyone always asks, like, are you a Cameron? I was like, no, Cameron's every woman I've ever fallen in love with. <laughs> I'm a Helen. I did Glee Club. You know, I wanted to be a first supreme. I was an alpha too. Uh, so, so um, that's something that came about through other people's work. That's just what I wanted to say. And I really like your <laughs> Does anybody? Oh, yeah, it's great. You're really earnest, and you never make fun of her. And I feel like that's a tricky character to play because it's so easy to like poo her sincerity. Yeah, how did you approach that? Well, that's definitely a part. Yeah. Yeah. Very much. Um, mm -hmm. That's very much. And I, I talked to this too. I talked about this to a couple of you know friends who've seen the film and, and asked me if they heard about what it was like working on it. I have to thank you with a lot of that because I remember a couple of points in particular where my my own interpretation of her her experience and her thought processes were were a little more a, a little more judgmental. Uh, yeah, a little more judgmental or like a little showy, like the karaoke scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's such a good example. You actually have a like. I mean, I think, I think your voice is a little better. Than, like, like, I think you're you're I'm singing a character. Yeah, you were singing, but well, I could tell, yeah. and I know that was a. I that actually is a very brave thing to do as an actor. You want to show the best of your skills. Yeah. You want to be like, I am the best singer, and Melanie's the singer. But Helen's not as good a singer as you, and I kept telling you that when you were prepping. I was like, I want you to know this song forwards and backwards, and Helen's not as good as you are. <laughs> like, she can't quite hit those high notes. Right. It was very generous to get with that. <laughs> well, it, it was real. It yeah. Was, it was her, it was, and that's why we only, I think we did that in one. That was just one. It wasn't one, that was a rough night. <laughs> that was the reason it wasn't one is because the, uh, God bless Marcus Kirschman, production designer. He's a genius, and uh, I'm very, very happy with production design. But we couldn't, whenever there's anything technical that has to happen, be it like a text, and it comes at the right moment, which unfortunately, 93, we didn't need a text. But um, whenever anything technical needs to happen on set, have you noticed this? No matter how great your crew is, everything fucks up. Oh, yeah. It's so hard. Any awful. lighting change, like if it's if it one on light bulb yeah, yeah. that has to yeah. turn on, then it suddenly it will not turn on, and everything sure. will go wrong. And like the karaoke, we couldn't get the clip. To go, oh, yeah, yeah. it was such a pain in the ass. So it wasn't your performance that made it like forty you taste. But when it, it, when it finally went, it, it went, and it was yes, and it was great. Yeah, but Two days. Only, yeah, right. But you nailed it on the first one, and then we just had a safety. But before that, we when when we were when I was talking with you about like how we would do it, I wanted to make her a little showy because in my mind it was where I only get to shine, you know, where yeah, she gets yeah, to yeah. show a little bit. And you grabbed me, and I have to credit with you with that because she was shy. Really, really, what's that? She's so shy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. wonderful. Yeah, and you, you helped me tap into that and, and ground that, and it wasn't until I saw her, I was like, oh, of course, duh. Yeah, yeah. it's just you. It's such a <laughs> pure moment, it's just so good. Yeah, it's so pure. Yeah. Can I ask, um, does there be another amazing movie called Appropriate Behavior, which you, should, you all should check out, um, and you are just finishing up a television show right now, in which you're also acting in, right? right? Yeah, that's are you asking him the next time? Yeah. Okay, so being someone who's uh, It's better to direct, that was your question. No, I was just, you know, you're, you're a triple threat, that's interesting, and I'm, I wanna know what's it like to not have to direct yourself? Was, was, that, was that a nice for you? Yeah, a break? it's so much better. Yeah. It's so much better, oh, yeah. never, ever. I mean, you've done it too. Yeah, but okay, yeah. yeah, well, it was awful, right? Yeah, it's no, awful. it's like your brain has to be in, you know, eight million different places at one time, and it's extremely hard to be really good at all of those you jobs. You kind of fail like everything at once. Yeah, yeah. You do like a slightly <laughs> shittier job. That's right. Like all the jobs. But I, I don't know, I'm curious because, I mean, or do you feel like you're more, do you feel like you're more difficult on yourself when you're, when you're acting? And do you, do, you feel, do you feel like your technique changed having gone from this movie where you could step outside yourself, you're not having to actually internalize everything and, you know, propel every aspect of it and then go back into something where you are going yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah. I assume you're playing a lead in a yeah. show. Oh. I'm in every scene, it sucks. Wow. <laughs> you you did that to yourself, I though, did you? Yeah. Um. I pitched that, to be fair, before I got this film greenlit. I needed a job. So, I pitched the show, I was so excited to write it, and I felt like it would be so great to, to finally, you know, I learned a thing or two in appropriate behavior. I didn't know better. 
And um, so I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this at a better level and I'll know what I'm doing. And then I made this film and it spoiled me. And I was like, oh, this is what it's like to work with real actors. Like, this is what it's like when you have a bit of space. Like, you can craft something and you get to have your whole brain, not just like the fourth that's available to you between setups. Um, it was, a, I got a spoil. And I learned what it is to be a director and it's to be a curator. It's to like, take the temperature and read what everyone needs and get the fuck out of their way if they don't need you. I mean, Chloe, I love shooting sex scenes. I think they're a really great opportunity. Um, I know someone's laughing, not the pretty way. Uh, <laughs> but I think they're a missed opportunity to do some really great storytelling and some intimate storytelling that you can't see in a scene, in any other scene. And getting out of Chloe's way and like, giving her a, an opportunity to do her thing and to express herself and to tell the story was incredible. And it's funny because before then, I had done this, there's three some scene inappropriate behavior that I'm very proud of, and I'm in it. And I thought that was the pinnacle of my good directing and that I had to do it physically myself because I had to have, I had to do it myself. And yeah, yeah getting out of her way and letting her do it was actually the best scene I've ever directed. How was that for you, Chloe? Like, what do you, I mean, when you're having to be that vulnerable on screen, is it a situation where you, you, you know, you, do you feel like you're able to specifically articulate what you need from a director in that moment, or is this kind of a, you know, I know, I, I know instinctually where to take this at this point, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go there. Well, I mean, I think it's a testament to Desi as a director, and I think, you know, I've, I've done sex scenes in movies since I was 16, and I know, like, the thing, the thing with this, this movie, and the sex scenes in this movie in particular, I would say that there's not one that's voyeuristic. It doesn't not progress the story. You're not just watching them have sex for no real reason. There's a point, and without those moments, I don't think the movie would have progressed in the way that it should have. But the difference in filming the ones that I've filmed with other directors, specifically male directors, compared to with Desi, is that for the first time, it was, it was, honestly, it was Quinn and I in control, and she, knew that we were competent of achieving what we needed to achieve in the scene. It wasn't by the numbers of you need to have this moment, we need this look on your face, you need to have this body part doing this, which in every other movie I've done, it's been literally hours of like deliberating exactly what we're doing in the moment mm -hmm. with a, literally a room of men. Mm -hmm. It feels like, like there's the first no room for magic there. There's no room for like spontaneity. Right. And by the way, Quinn is Quinn Shepard who plays Coley. Yeah, and you literally walked away. I mean, the scene in the car, she and the rest of the crew hid in the in the school. Mm -hmm. And it was just Ashley Connor, our DP, camera operator, mm -hmm. and the focus puller hid underneath the car. Mm -hmm. And then it was just Quinn and I in the back seat. And we did the I two takes. You didn't watch your rehearsal. No. You did, did the two takes, but each, it was fun. Like, each one went somewhere different because yeah. when he caught you, there were different you guys, things. yeah. And then it was the one where the train just happened to be passing at the yeah. same time that suddenly it was magic. And lost but like, the sound, yeah. Yeah, uh, they were all different and good, and it was like watching theater in some ways. Like you guys had a look, and the fallout when he walks in, and the discomfort. You went different places on each take. It was a really special moment in my life on set. Right, and that's that's I mean, a testament to you being comp like being confident enough to give it to your actors and your DP. And but knowing the experience of being an actor in that situation, right? mm -hmm. like I knew if I were you, I wouldn't want me putting my hands in it. Like, I, yeah, I sense that you knew what was up. But also having the confidence to not cut outside of the car yeah, in that right. moment, too. And keep, you know, was there. the reveal, <laughs> and, yeah, you shot it. You had that coverage, <laughs> yeah, but you knew, like, it was stronger to stay with her in that moment. That's actually Connor, too. She's like, amazing, man. She's amazing. Yeah. Her hand held like butter. Yeah. yeah. No. Her hand held so good. Yeah, she operated the entire yeah. film. She had a real relationship with all the actors mm -hmm. that I didn't have. It felt like we were mom and dad. Yeah. And she had an intimacy physically with you guys because yeah. she was in there with that camera. She's really good at this. Yeah. Are there any questions from the audience? Mm -hmm. Me? Yes. I don't really have a question. It's more of just like a statement type. Um, so I, I saw I saw a clip of this and I immediately had to see it just because um, I'm a gay Christian so I just was very fond of it you know um, so I have to say it was just very beautiful and I saw a lot of myself in it 
Um, not so much the going to the camp type because um, I did grow up in a small country town in Texas um, and it was it was a little bit hard. I never have. Hold on, can you guys hear back there? I'm going to give you my microphone because you're saying interesting things. I grew up in a small, like very political Christian town in Texas, um, so I was always kind of scared to like be myself. Um, but in a way, I did see and experience a lot of that. What Cameron and the other characters did when they were at the camp, um, it, it really hasn't been so much of um, you know this is wrong. You know, you're a Christian and you can't be like this. I have been blessed to have a supporting mother, family, my dad, not so much. Um, but however, I love the you know coming of age story. You're figuring yourself out, you know, because I was 18 at the time, just went to college, straight out of high school, um, and I was you know obviously experimenting. So um, and I did end up having just this breakdown because I realized. It was, it was just so hard just being 18 and young, you know. Um, and I did have to end up going to a mental hospital and was there for a week. So seeing this it was kind of like an image of me living that hospital life, you know. Um, it was, I was still just figuring myself out. And I, <laughs> I did um, have a gay roommate. And <laughs> we, um, we ended up doing things together. <laughs> so, but, no, it, it's just... Did you feel, I, I just, I hope you felt, not like sort of running this film, I hope you felt like it wasn't making fun of Christianity. No, 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 but, that's good. no, I, I um, it, it's hard because I do have people tell me, you know, you're living a sin, that you're going to hell and stuff, but um, being a strong believer in Christ and me being gay, it's, uh, I don't see it as an issue, but it, it, then again, same time, I know what, Chloe's character felt like, the other characters felt like to be in there because everyone's like, "This, you, do you want to change? Do you want to change?" But um, overall, it was just beautiful to me. Um, so yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Try not to shake here. I apologize for that. Um, I thought the movie was amazing. Um, my question is. Is for Chloe. Um, well, I don't know if it's a question or whatever, but um, I've been a fan since since the Kick-Ass movies, and a friend of mine, she wanted to be here tonight more than anything because she idolizes you, but she was unable to because her father passed away on Tuesday. Um, but since she couldn't be here, I was hoping. Uh, oh my God. Sorry. Um, I was hoping I'd be able to get a picture with, with Chloe to send my friend. We can definitely arrange for that afterwards. Yeah. Any questions? Sir? Uh, so, is Blustercise real? No, yes. <laughs> it is real. It is we real. found Blustercise. It's real. Oh, we have to work out to it. There's so much footage of me working out to that. <laughs> <laughs> so much so much for Jesus. That's a oh, good, good song. It's on one, right? It's on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, it's online. We found it. So basically, in the book, there was this fictitious character called, character called Tandy Campbell, and Aaron worked out that Tandy Campbell at a different point. Cameron joins her, and um, we were in this position where we're like, "Oh God, we're gonna have to shoot this Christian workout video," and I don't want to because it sounds like it would be lampooning Christians, and it would be like it's so easy to take the piss. And if I had shot that, I'd have been like, "Oh, that's great, you're an asshole." Like that's. <laughs> But then Jachilia, my co-writer, and one of my producers found that video online, tracked down the man who made it through his daughter on Facebook, got us the rights. I mean, she's a hustler, and it's entirely, but I love it. And, um, it exists. Have they seen a kind of movie before they wrote it? No. Oh, that's <laughs> one of our fears is that, well, it's too late now, but it's still too late. They signed a contract, they signed a contract. They took the so anyway, I'm really grateful that that existed and that she's really found it, and it's authentic. <laughs>
question for Holly. And what's the biggest challenge on taking this role? Um, I think it was, I think for both of us, um, we just found it very important to get the, the, the reality of what it was like to be in a conversion therapy center, what that felt like. And so we, we did a lot of research with meeting uh, real survivors who had been through conversion therapy. Um, and that was just important to me. You know, my biggest question was, when you showed up to the camp, did you immediately think this was total BS and did you not try? And it was unanimous from the five survivors that we talked to that if anything, they were the ones that were first and foremost being so deliberate about trying to get rid of this disease. Because the way that they really prose it to you is that you have a form of, of cancer and, and you wouldn't want to not get rid of that. Um, so I just thought that was very interesting and it, it really uh, spoke to us with how to get through that point in time in the script where she, she chooses to give in, which went really against obviously my personal ideals of who I am. Um, but after speaking to them, you know, we, we really wanted to hit that note. Yeah. Missing the glasses. shot at is where everyone was living. So the lighting and the timing of it all also yeah. lent itself to the fact that we didn't really have the time to light things you know, fully out and build <laughs> it out. Uh, we shot day for day and night for night. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think across the board, it was, it was super natural. That's sort of a low key, very chill. We didn't set. do much hair and makeup at yeah. all. And we just, you know, we didn't have much time to do big setups. It was really Ashley just getting the camera where we can get it and when we can do it and shooting as much as we can at that time. Do you find yourself aware of lighting back then? Yeah. Do I think you're very aware of uh, yeah, technical things? Yeah, I find that for sure. Yeah. But just because I, I find, yeah. Do you ever worry that the visibility wouldn't be enough? I think that's no, I'd say your face. <laughs> you know, and, and yeah, losing yeah. some aspects of your face and losing some aspects of that. But I mean, that's a testament to Ashley. She, there was never a moment on our faces that wasn't depicted on screen because she, no matter the lighting, she knew where to be at the right time. At the I right never doubted it. Yeah. No. You never doubted it? No, never doubted it. Well, there's a balance in being able to do that and still have everyone look so present and beautiful. And this is a movie where you, you do, you know, want to see everyone's eyes and expressions and how they're feeling and that's how you, that's how you're, you know, that's your hand. And so it's, it's nice to be able to do that and have this mood being set with how you guys shoot at the same time. Miss with the hand of writing this with my co-writer Cecilia also 
uh, researching the leaders of gay conversion therapy, particularly Exodus International, which is a now defunct umbrella organization that would advocate for gay conversion therapy in America and was a resource center. Uh, the founders of which, two dudes, so I don't remember who them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, some of them are really tragic and never were able to find peace within themselves. And I kind of fell in love with them and how sad and tortured they were and, and figuring out how do they do this. Do places with yeah. this model still exist right now yes. in America? Yeah. Yes, they do in America. There aren't as many residential centers as there were before, but I've noticed when we were looking online to find some, a lot of them are called like at-risk teen centers. and, and um, but they still exist, and there are many also like individual therapists who practice. And New York and LA are the two like hot spots. So they be like centers that don't necessarily focus on well, like, gay conversion. They, they, they do a plethora of things. They say they do a plethora, but that's that part of the US, okay. and they're not going to advertise it because increasingly there's been more legislation against this for minors. Mm -hmm. it's, only, it's only illegal in uh, in 14 states in America, and in those states, it's only illegal for minors. Yeah. And 700,000 people are currently affected and have been through conversion. And the, the minimum is 57,000 kids within the next five years will go through conversion therapy. So that's today. That's today. That's today. Wow. Is that through if it continues at the same rate? Yeah, it's if it continues at the same rate, yeah. Miss in the corner? So what this is, is you know, if you guys like the movie, tweet about it, Instagram about it. The more tickets you buy, the more that we have a chance and possibility of this movie being seen in places that this could change the perspective of people that you know could be bigoted. Yeah, and I don't know exactly how you advertise that. I mean, I think casting Chloe for, for talent exclusively, but also hoping that now some of her appeal uh, can lend itself to those red states. But I don't know. I don't want to make a film such as Preach of the Choir. It's something that I worry about a lot. And, Anyone has an idea, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> My question is for Lisa Ray. I just wanted to know was there a specific reason why uh, Chloe didn't throw the, uh, uh, the, the, the Polaroid? The fire yeah. So the and question was why didn't Chloe throw her Polaroid into the fire? And it's such a subtle, tiny thing, and I don't think it will matter to anyone, but I just wanted to re retain the idea that she loved her aunt and felt connected to her and wanted to hold on to that picture and felt a bit of nostalgia for her and didn't, wasn't mad at her, just missed her. It's such a tiny, stupid thing. And it's, no, I, I, felt, I felt like you would want to throw it away since that whole memory was of, you know, just a kid have that memory, so. Yeah, but that's also the kind of abuse I wanted to show in the stone um, at the hands of people who love you. And she loved her aunt, and she understands why she did that. And it's not black and white of just like, this is all bad. That place introduced her to the first queer people she ever met, and it enabled her to be honest in a way she wasn't back at home. And her aunt was doing her best to raise her, and that's the hard thing. That's the thing I always struggled with growing up, was how do you, how do you love and what do you do with that love for the people who hurt you and who are doing their best and who only mean who can't fucking help themselves? Yeah, we just gotta love them back. Yeah. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Um, thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. And again, if you like this movie, tell someone about it.